M S W Media. Big shout out today to Helix Sleep. Take their two-minute sleep quiz and they'll match you to a mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. In honor of Labor Day, Helix is offering 25% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for listeners. Just go to helixsleep.com slash dailybeans and use code HELIXPARTNER25. Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Wednesday, August 23rd, 2023. Today, the hottest club in Atlanta is the Rice Street Jail, as indicted Trump co-defendants turn themselves into police. The D.C. Attorney General has launched a criminal investigation into Federalist Society co-chair Leonard Leo. Mark Meadows and Jeffrey Clark think they're better than other criminal defendants and therefore shouldn't face arrest in Fulton County. Vivek Ramaswamy was caught straight up lying on CNN about 9-11 conspiracy theories, and the Arkansas Nine have joined the fight to keep AP African American Studies in Arkansas schools. I'm Allison Gill. And I'm Dana Goldberg. Hey, Dana, how are you? I'm good, and everyone can't see it, but your hair looks very pretty for this meetup in Denver. Oh, well, thank you very much. I was on a panel this morning at Podcast Movement. I'm here in Denver. So if you hear like a a tiny refrigerator humming in the background, I'm not back to the kitchen table days. I'm just in a hotel. It might be a little more echoey in here than usual. So I just wanted to kind of give that (laughs) forewarning. Allison, is your refrigerator running? Just kidding. Keep going. (laughs) Why, yes. (laughs) Let me go catch it. Also, there's a new episode of Clean Up on Aisle 45 out today. And we go over everything uh, down in Fulton County. Like I said, I'm at the at podcast movement. And I have to tell you, Dana, I'm having a great time here. It's all, everybody's podcasters, right? We're all a bunch of podcasters, but no one recognizes anyone until we talk. That's <laughs> really funny, actually. <laughs> That's a, It's like, hey, hey, oh, hey, wait, AG, yeah, oh, you, yes, I know, yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. So we're all just staring at each other's badges to see who, what show we're on. And so, or, or, or we listen, wait to hear each other speak. <laughs> My eyes are up here, podcast movement. Hello. But um, I'm having a really good time here and Denver is beautiful. And I can't wait to meet the, the patrons at the meet and greet today. If you want to become a patron and go to these meet and greets, you can do that by going to patreon.com slash Muller. She wrote. And uh, yeah, if you, if you like to hear Pete Strzok swear, uh, like I said at the top of this discussion, you you definitely need to listen to today's Clean Up on Aisle 45 pod. It's hot. It's the hottest club in Atlanta right now. All right. We have a lot of news to get to. Let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. All right. The first of Donald Trump's co-defendants in Georgia's criminal case, accusing the former president and his associates of subverting his 2020 election loss, surrendered at an Atlanta jail on Tuesday. And that's according to county records and a statement and a bunch of media and cameras standing outside the courthouse, seeing those people and talking to them. Trump's former lawyer, John Eastman, and Republican poll watcher Scott Hall both surrendered to the county sheriff's office two days before Trump himself was set to turn himself in to face his fourth criminal indictment this year. Eastman said in a statement he would surrender the day after agreeing to a $100,000 bond agreement, $100,000. Quote, I'm here today to surrender to an indictment that should have never been brought, he said. It represents a crossing of the Rubicon for our country, implicating the fundamental First Amendment right to petition the government for redress of grievances. That is like saying the attack on the Capitol was a was a peaceful protest. That is basically still their argument that they're they weren't cooing. They were redressing grievances. That's all. It's insane. Where do you draw the line between redressing grievances and cooing? What 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 do they where would that be? Where would that line be? I think we're about to find out from Fonnie Willis. <laughs> well, I know where the line is and you know where the line is, but what do they do? They think there has to be tanks. Right, exactly. Or like, what the fuck? So dumb. Now, Hall, a Republican poll watcher in Georgia's Fulton County, was booked by the county sheriff's office Tuesday and has not yet been released. That's according to jail records. Hall previously agreed to a $10,000 bond requiring that he report to pretrial supervision every 30 days. Trump on Monday, as we said, agreed to post $200,000 and uh, accepted bail conditions that would bar him from threatening co-defendants or witnesses in the case. And in Georgia, you only have to put up 10%. So we only had to put up 20 large. 
Now, Meadows asked to delay his surrender until after a hearing in federal court Monday, but he was rebuffed by Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis, who told his lawyer she will seek his arrest if he doesn't turn himself in by Friday at noon. Let me read you this email exchange. This is to Fonnie Willis. On behalf of our client, Mark Meadows, we wanted to reach out and see if you or an appropriate representative from your team would be available for a call this afternoon. Yesterday, Meadows removed the criminal proceeding your office initiated against him to the district court for the Northern District of Georgia. He didn't remove it. He, he filed a petition to do so. Quote, it appears that the clerk already entered you on the docket and provided you a copy by email, but I'm attaching a copy for your convenience. We intend to move the court promptly to determine that removal should be permitted and to notify the state court. Oh, I see. When they say moved, they, that's his motion. Got it. As provided in 28 U.S. Code 1455B5, or in the alternative to stay state criminal proceedings against Mr. Meadows pending consideration of his notice of removal. Basically, please don't arrest me until we figure out whether I'm going to get this taken out of state court. Goes on to say, I should also note that Danny Griffin spoke with Mr. Wade earlier today to request an opportunity to confer timing and logistics in connection with the state court proceeding. Mr. Wade suggested Mr. Griffin call on Monday morning at 1030 to have that discussion. We would welcome the opportunity to confer on those issues sooner, but we'll otherwise wait for Monday morning. Then Fonnie Willis writes back, uh, we can discuss this and the issue of your client's bond on Monday at 1030 a.m. Unfortunately, no one from my team will be available prior to that time. Yours in service, Fonnie Willis. Then Meadows writes back, I spoke with your team this morning about a consent bond from Mark Meadows. We're reviewing your office's proposed terms and we'll discuss them with our client. We understand that you have set a deadline this Friday at noon for voluntary surrender. We respectfully request a modest extension of that deadline. As you know, Mr. Meadows has removed the case against him to federal court. Judge Steve C. Jones issued an order last Wednesday declining summary remand and setting a hearing for one week from today, Monday, August 28th at 10 a.m. to address removal. We believe it would be eminently reasonable and the best allocation of the party's resources to defer voluntary surrender for Mr. Meadows until next week. If you agree, we'll be prepared to meet and confer with you immediately following the federal court hearing, which is scheduled for less than one business day after the current deadline. We can then discuss the path forward, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you for your consideration. And this is the DA's reply. Which is beautiful. <laughs> I'm not granting any extensions. I gave two weeks for people to surrender themselves to the court. Your client's no different than any other criminal defendant in this jurisdiction. The two weeks was a tremendous courtesy. At 12.30 p.m. on Friday, I shall file warrants in the system. My team has availability to meet to discuss reasonable consent bonds Wednesday and Thursday. Now, I just want to let you know that kind of between me writing this script and us recording this show, Mark Meadows' attorneys wrote back and responded to that. And I want to pull this up for you because it's absolutely one of the most privileged piles of shit I've uh, ever had the, uh, the joy of reading. So let me see if I can pull this up. Here's the letter. District Attorney Willis, I write in response to your email rejecting our request in my letter yesterday for a modest extension, et cetera, et cetera. While I can understand the sentiment behind your assertion that Mr. Meadows is no different than any other criminal defendant, we both know that is simply not true mm. when it comes to our request. He basically wrote back and said, no, we aren't the same yeah. as anybody else, and we need special treatment. So absolutely incredible. For more, including Jeffrey Clark being a dick about this too, you can listen to today's episode of Clean Up on All 45, although this email exchange is pretty new. Uh, that won't be in there, but all of the stuff leading up to it is. Thank you so much, AG. And next up from Politico, Washington, D.C., Attorney General Brian Schwalb is investigating judicial activist Leonard Leo and his network of nonprofit groups. And this is according a person direct knowledge of this probe. The scope of the investigation is unclear at this point, but it comes after Politico reported in March that one of Leo's nonprofits registered as a charity paid his for-profit company tens of millions of dollars in the two years since he joined the company. A week later, Progressive Watchdog Group filed a complaint with the D.C. Attorney General and the IRS requesting a probe into what services were provided and whether Leo was in violation of laws against using charities for personal enrichment. 
Now, David Rifkin Jr., an attorney for the parties in the investigation, said in a statement that the complaint is sloppy, deceptive, and legally flawed, and we are addressing this fully with the D.C. Attorney General's office. Mm-hmm, okay. Uh-huh. The news of the investigation comes as the nonprofit that was a subject of the complaint. They quietly relocated in recent weeks from the Capitol area to Texas. So from D.C. to Texas, according to paperwork filed in Virginia and Texas. For nearly 20 years, the nonprofit, only known as the 85 Fund, has been incorporated in Virginia. Now, best known as Donald Trump's White House court whisperer, Leo played a behind-the-scenes role in the nominations of all three of the former president's Supreme Court justices that he stole, I just added that, and promoted them through the multi-billion dollar network of nonprofits. Trump chose his three Supreme Court picks, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett, from a list drawn up by Leo. Now, more recently, Leo was the beneficiary of a $1.6 billion contribution, believed to be the biggest political donation in U.S. history. He's also the co-chair of the Federalist Society. Yep, the academic arm of the conservative legal movement, for which he worked in various capacities for decades while building his donor base. The Leo-aligned nonprofit, the 85 Fund, which is registered as a tax-exempt charity, paid tens of millions of dollars to a public relations firm in Virginia, which he co-chairs in the two years since he joined the firm, known as CRC Advisors. The watchdog complaint alleges the total amount of money that flowed from Leo-aligned nonprofits to his for-profit firms was $73 million over six years beginning in 2016. Further complicating the picture, in Texas, a new registration for the 85 Fund was filed on June 27th under yet a different address in a different city than the one listed on the Virginia paperwork. It's also registered in Texas as a for-profit entity. Oh. Hmm. Yep. This is all sketchy as fuck. This location is a UPS store in a strip mall next door to a restaurant called the Snooty Pig Cafe. (laughs) Now, as Politico previously reported, the 85 Fund has been using a UPS drop box in D.C.'s Georgetown neighborhood as its principal office of address. On July 7th, a Leo spokesperson offered an initial response to inquiries Politico had made about the 85 Fund, previously known as the Judicial Education Project. That was the day paperwork with Severino's signature was filed, and I quote, surrendering the 85 Fund's charter in Virginia. In the paperwork, Severino stated the plan to move to Texas was adopted by a majority of the board of directors on December 8th of 2022. It has three board members. By the way, in addition to Severino, they include Treasurer Gary Marks and Chair Todd Graves, and that's according to the latest IRS paperwork available. It's not the only major conservative nonprofit to have moved to Texas in recent years. Uh, The NRA contested multiple lawsuits from attorneys general in New York State and Washington, D.C., alleging violations of nonprofit law announced in early 2021 it would relocate to Texas. I'm actually shocked. I didn't know the NRA wasn't already in Texas, by the way. (laughs) Now, a separate Leo-aligned group that appears to have been involved in the 2017 sale of GOP pollster Killian Conway's company was dissolved last fall, three days after Politico inquired about whether it helped to facilitate the multi-million dollar deal while she was advising Trump on judicial candidates. Oopsie. Dark fucking money. This is the stuff Sheldon, Sheldon Whitehouse loves, loves to Mm -hmm. talk about. Yep. So uh, it is now under criminal investigation there by the D.C. Attorney General, was it? Attorneys General in a couple other places, yeah. Was it the D.C. Attorney General? Yeah, Brian Schwalb. Yep. So, yeah. So so Leonard Leo calls the complaint sloppy, deceptive, and legally flawed, but it sounds like his business practices are sloppy, deceptive, and legally flawed. Very legally flawed. Yep. All right, next up, last night, you might have seen Vivek Ramaswamy on CNN telling Caitlin Collins that a reporter at The Atlantic had misquoted him about federal agents being on the planes that crashed into the Twin Towers on 9-11. Let's listen to that part of the interview. Report in The Atlantic that you gave an interview to, you said, quote, I think it is legitimate to say how many police, how many federal agents were on the planes that hit the Twin Towers. Maybe the answer is zero. It probably is zero for all I know, right? I have no reason to think it was anything other than zero. But if we're doing a comprehensive assessment of what happened on 9-11, we have a 9-11 commission. Absolutely, there should be an answer 
the public knows the answer to. Explain to me what you meant there. This is really, it's funny. I mean, the Atlantic is playing the same game as CNN. It's funny. What I said is on January 6th, I do believe that there were many federal agents in the field and we deserve to know who they are. On 9-11, what I've said is that the government lied. And this is incontrovertible evidence, Caitlin. The government lied about Saudi Arabia's involvement. There was a Saudi spy named Al-Bayoumi who they lied and the government lied and the 9-11 commission lied. We know that because declassified reports in 2021 Which revealed that Al-Bayoumi was indeed. What's that? Yeah, the report that the President Biden declassified. Yes. But your quote here, are you telling me that the quote is wrong 20 years later, here? yeah. But are you telling me that I'm your quote you is wrong, wrong here because actually. it says how many federal actually, agents were on I, the plane in the asked, Twin Towers? <laughs> yeah, when, when, I, when I actually, and this is just lifting the curtain on how media works again, I asked that reporter to send the recording because it was on the record. He refused to do it. Well, guess fucking what? We got the audio. Yes. Let's roll it. I think it is legitimate to say how many police, how many federal agents were on the planes that hit the Twin Towers? Like, I think we want it. Maybe the answer is zero. Probably a zero for all I know, right? I have no reason to think it was anything other than zero. What a fucking liar. He lied his face off. He's a piece of shit conspiracy theorist. And if you want to hear Pete Strzok's profanity lace rant about it, again, check out today's <laughs> cleanup on aisle 45. He just sat there and was like, no, I never said that. They misquoted me. It's bullshit. You and the media do this. And then he goes off on the media. Man, you and the Atlantic, just like CNN. You fucking misquote me. And he's smiling the whole time with his, uh, with his big fucking, sm mm, it's just, he lied. He just directly lied to her face. And then, and then the reporter sent in the audio and, and it's been published. It's everywhere online. If you, you know, if you want to like make it a ringtone or something, maybe you can download it from the show, but, <laughs> but holy shit, what a dickhead. Oh my God. Speaking of dickheads, we're going to Arkansas to talk about Sarah Huckabee again. Uh, this is from Bracey Harris at NBC. I kind of love this story, though. Several surviving members of the Little Rock Nine. This is a group of students who in 1957 integrated Little Rock Central High School under threats of violence from white segregationists. They are denouncing the Arkansas Department of Education's restrictions on an advanced placement African-American studies course. Fuck yeah. Now, the state is not barring students from taking the class, but it's cautioned that the coursework may not count toward the state's high school graduation requirements. The Arkansas Department of Education has argued that since the course is still being piloted, it's unclear whether it runs afoul of a state law signed by Republican Governor Huckabee Sanders in March banning the teaching of, and I quote, critical race theory, which is just fucking bullshit. All right, this is a quote from the story. I think the attempts to race history is working for the Republican Party. This is from Elizabeth Eckford, who joined eight other black teenagers in desegregating Little Rock Central High School nearly 66 years ago. Elizabeth went on to say they have some boogeyman that are really popular with their supporters. Now, the Arkansas Department of Education defended its decision, saying in a statement that until it's determined whether it violates state law and teaches or trains teachers in CRT and indoctrination, the state will not move forward. The department encourages the teaching of all American history and supports rigorous courses not based on opinions or indoctrination. God. The state already offers an African-American history course, the department noted. Now, a spokesperson for Sanders did not immediately respond to a request for comment. And when asked about the course on Fox News Thursday, Sanders responded by saying that she wants to focus on improving students' performance rather than pushing a propaganda leftist agenda. Go fuck yourself. Propaganda uh, leftist yep. agenda. Teaching what happened. Okay. Yep. Ivory Tolston, the Director of Education Innovation and Research at the NAACP, said officials censored what can be taught. They are channeling their energy into the wrong battles. Civil rights advocates and education policy experts have long highlighted racial disparities in AP course participation and access. Black children, Tolson said, often don't have the opportunity to sign up for the rigorous offerings, which can earn students college credits while they're still in high school. And this is a quote from the story. These are the larger issues I wish they would talk about as they go on defense about this issue, he said. They really should be setting forth the plan to make sure all black students in Arkansas have equal access to quality education. Tolson, who spoke this week with five members of the Little Rock Nine, said that they see the criticism of the AP course as a broader attack on black history because it is. Melba Beals, who participated in the call, 
also shared a reflection with the NAACP vowing that future generations would take up the banner for civil rights that the Little Rock Nine helped carry. Should keep kicking, she wrote. See how many more heroines and heroes you can build. These nine people, I mean, they have seen some shit. And I mean, they're not going to back down from this. I think it's a beautiful thing that they're one still alive to do this and that they still have the energy to fight for this stuff. They shouldn't have to. Yes, they shouldn't have years to. later. Yeah. And, you know, we we brought up this story a couple days ago about, you know, the, the schools fighting back. And one of them was Central High. And it, they mentioned we mentioned in that story that is the home of Little Rock Nine. And so it's to read this today. I had to put this in here today to say that the Little, Little Rock Nine is participating in this fight 66 years later. It just reminds me of that. There was a woman's rights march where a woman uh, was holding a sign that said, I can't believe I still have to protest this shit. Yep. And, and it's it's just these. this is the Republican Party. And I actually wouldn't even call it a party anymore. Judge Ludick was on Deadline White House, said there is no Republican Party. He said today there is no Republican Party. Because it's trying to overthrow democracy is not political. And the fact that we only have one functioning, robust party in this nation right now is why, is one of the main, you know, main reasons why democracy is in peril. Absolutely. We just don't have a Republican Party at this point. It's, it's fascists. So, damn. All right, everybody, we need good news. Send in your good news. Um, so you can do that at dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. And we're going to read some of that good news, but we have to take a quick break. So everybody stick around. We'll be right back. After these messages, we'll be right back. Hey, everybody, as you know, you know my sleep history like better than most people. <laughs> I used to toss and turn all night, but my Helix mattress changed all that. I took their sleep quiz, found my perfect fit. Now every night feels like I'm sleeping on a cloud. I wake up feeling fresh and better than ever. It's incredible. Just go to helixsleep.com slash daily beans, pick their two minute sleep quiz. They will match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. And you'll get 25% off all mattress orders and two free pillows with the code helixpartner25. With Helix, you are never short on choices. They offer 20 different mattresses, including the award winning Lux collection and the newly launched Helix Elite line. They have designs specifically for big and tall sleepers. They even have mattresses for kids. But it's not just about variety, it's about quality. Helix has mattresses with innovative cooling technology that ensures your body stays the right temperature, whether it's a hot summer night or a chilly winter morning. My perfect mattress, as you well know, is the Helix Midnight because I like a medium firm bed and I sleep on my side. This is the best mattress I've ever owned, head and shoulders. There's no contest. I would never go back to any other mattress. And finding the right one for you is a breeze with the Helix Sleep Quiz. In just under two minutes, it points you to your ideal mattress, which is shipped directly to your door free of charge. Forget those overwhelming trips to mattress stores. Helix brings convenience to your doorstep. If you're still uncertain, Helix's reputation speaks for itself with over 12,000 five-star reviews. So try it for yourself and you'll see what all the fuss is about. Helix is offering 25% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners in honor of Labor Day. Go to helixsleep.com slash dailybeans and use code helixpartner25. This is their best offer yet and it won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Everybody, welcome back. It's time for the good news. Who likes good news? Good news. Good news. And if you have any good news, confessions, corrections, if you want to play What the Mutt, where we try to guess what breeds make up your dog, or uh, What the Hequine, because I guess for some reason I'm really good at guessing horse breeds. You're very breeds. good at that. <laughs> so weird. Uh, pictures of frog orgies are great. Um, baby photos for Dana. Shout out to a loved one. Shout out to your small business or one in your area that you want to help support. Um, shout out to yourself. I want to know what you're doing. I tell me what is amazing about you. I, I would love to hear it. Uh, Whoopie stories are so much blanky stories, stuffy stories, anything and everything. Send me a photo of your happy place if you have one. I think we all have one. Or maybe draw me a picture of your happy place. Whatever it is, seriously, send it into us. Dailybeanspod.com. Click on contact. First up from Jane with a Y, pronoun she and her. Hey, y'all, longtime listener, first time good newser. I wanted to share some very good news um, in me and my wife's life. This past week, my wife had a very important interview, which the result of dictates her ability to move or to not move forward in seeking 
ordination within our church denomination, UMC. Nice. Our denomination is currently fracturing due to many churches choosing to leave based on the future imminent decisions on the full inclusion of all people, regardless of their sexuality within the church. So going into this interview, we were more than worried that this might have been a roadblock in her path. I'm so proud to say that my wife killed it in her interview and she's been approved to move to the next step in the very difficult yet meaningful process for her career. I know it might not be the biggest good news in the world, but for us, an open lesbian couple, and for her, a proud bisexual woman in the denomination with a terrible history of queer inclusion, this means so much. We do have some fur babies to share. Our first, Rosie, seven, whom we rescued back in 2016 and is our best friend in the world. I've included a picture of her proudly marching with her mamas during Pride pre-pandemic, and our cat, Toby, 14, who we adopted back at the beginning of this year after his previous owner passed away. I love the uh, adopting of the senior pets. It's so beautiful to give them loving home in their final years. He's the sweetest boy in the world, although I might be biased. Aww. Thanks for all you do. He's beautiful. Oh my god. Oh my god, look at the second picture. I know. So good. <laughs> the, it's a beautiful dog with a rainbow outfit and it's amazing. Marching in a pride parade. I mean, he's very proud, too. He's like, look at me. Yes, that is the definition of pride right there. But what a beautiful thing. You know, that's how we make these changes. That's yep. how we become the change. It's, it's, you know, from the inside. Get in there and shake shit up, you know? Absolutely. That's Absolutely what our Beans amazing. listeners do. They're shakers. That's what they are. All right. This is from Anonymous. Pronouns she and her. Ask and you shall receive, Beans over ladies. Good news for a hard week. The rescue where I've gotten my last two pups, Muttville in San Francisco, adopted out their 11,000th dog this last week. Muttville specializes in senior pups, seven and up, and has in addition a hospice program for dogs nearing their end that includes sponsored medical costs. For pet tags, I offer Sullivan, the wonder dog, my blind senior living his best life. He's the jumping one. Look at his beard. Oh my God, he's so cute. And the other one watching, I love. Yeah. He's well. like, I can like, do that. Hey, look at him. I want to do that too. Oh, what Muttville in San Francisco. Everybody, this sounds like a really worthwhile cause. If you have anything you can, uh, you know, send over to them, even if it's just a phone call to say thanks for everything that you do. Because adopting out senior pets is one of the coolest things I can fucking think of. And then a hospice care with medical costs. That's so amazing. Um, so thank you for for drawing attention to that anonymous next up janice in san diego whoop whoop san diego pronoun she and her hello beans queens i just want to give a shout out to the nonprofit saving animals and healing hearts an animal rescue in ramona california saving animals and healing hearts is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the rescue rehabilitation and rehoming of abused and neglected animals it's 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 animal day it's it it's is. rescue animal day here on the beans they have pigs and sheep and goats and horses and donkeys who can be very loud. Chickens, turkeys, a tortoise, and even peacocks who can be extremely loud at feeding time. <laughs> Shout out to their director, Terry Crutchfield. I've been volunteering to help feed pigs and do general maintenance around the place. It gives me a good feeling to be able to help out not only the animals, but Terry as well. Plus, I love petting Jackson the donkey and the pigs. Check out their website. It's S-A-H-H for the number four life.org. Look at these. I'm assuming saving animals and healing hearts is the S A H A. I would think you're correct. Number four life.org. Oh, Aww. goat donkey. Oh, I love the donkey. <gasps> and the oh, I love the donkey. Yes. S A H H four life.org. Everybody go help them out. Thank so you for good. that submission. Seriously. All right. This is from Kate, pronouns she and her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, AG and DG for everything, but especially for that perfect California moment where, while AG was worrying about Hurricane Hillary, Dana calmly said, hold on, we're having an earthquake and I have to move away from the window. <laughs> <laughs> now an American voting absentee in Kilauna. British Columbia in Canada, Kil Kilona, I hope I'm saying that right. I sometimes find myself homesick for my beloved San Francisco, where I lived for 20 plus years. Dana, that was so perfect. 5.1, no big deal. Let's get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> We're currently in the middle of a huge wildfires in Kelowna. 
Oh, maybe it is Kelowna. That makes sense. Kelowna area. We've been kind enough before to feature my Yorkshire Terrier Ruby. This time I'm asking for people who can help to BC SPCA Kelowna branch with food for dogs, cats, and cat litter, or make a donation. They're helping people who managed to get their pets evacuated, but couldn't stop to get food out as well. Here's the URL. And it's a little bit long, but it's the spca.bc.ca slash donations slash Kelowna, which is K-E-L-O-W-N-A. And we'll have that link in the show notes. Thank you for all you do. You're the best. SPCA.BC.CA slash donations slash Kelowna. Um, and I, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that in, incorrectly. I know it's in British Columbia up in Canada. Yeah, I, I know. I hadn't, hadn't thought about that. When the wildfires, the animals are rescued, they're rushed out, some of them, and then but you leave the food behind. So that is where you go if you want to make a donation of food or litter for dogs and uh, litter for the cats uh, and also cat food if you want to feed the cats. <laughs> Um, but they also accept donations. That's so wonderful. Look at this baby. <gasps> no, no. Oh, Cutie like pie. Glasses frames too. Yeah, those are good. Kate, okay, those are great. All right. Very cool. Another animal donation sitch. All right. What do we got next? Trudy, pronoun she and her. Hi, friends. OG kitchen listener from Australia. Love what you do. Love the information you curate. We see you as the early warning system. As our Murdoch media monopoly, 60%. Just seems to cut, paste, import whatever outrage is current in your neck of the woods. So thanks for that. And then there's an emoji with the, the the hands hiding the eyes. Anyway, I just wanted to give you some good news from Down Under. We just finished co-hosting the Women's World Cup, and it's been such an overwhelmingly popular cultural changing event. 11 million Australians watched on TV. Almost 2 million attended games. Outdoor overflow venues were filled to capacity. Kids of all kinds saw inspirational women of all colors, religions, sexual orientation, doing what they love best, unapologetically, including the first woman to play in a World Cup with a hijab, a single mother of a two-year-old, uh, women who were outspoken about the lack of funding in their country or similar gender-based problems. As a direct result, our own government has committed $200 million to support women's sport, targeting soccer uh, and the AFL, which is our football. Have They have today said they will have prize money parity from next year. Wow, that's awesome. Yep. While there are definite ongoing problems that need attention and there aren't easy fixes, to see 32 teams of women featured on our primetime TV's front page of all the papers and all spaces usually reserved for men's sports, it's a win in my book. My pod pet payment is the Affin Pincher Dart. He's a fancy show dog but it's just as much at home in my bed eating toast for breakfast. <laughs> they are a German ratting breed who think they're 10 feet tall, and they are not. They're only 12 inches. I Aww. love Affin Pinchers. Look at this little guy. It's so See. cute. And Trudy, I was rooting for the Matildas. When the USA got knocked out, I wanted you all to take the entire tournament. And in that, um, oh man, in the semifinal game when... Kerr uh, scored that goal to even up the score and they showed video of Australia losing their shit. And I was as well. It was the most perfectly executed two on one goal by Kerr. It was beautiful. Um, so I, I, you got your team has a, a bright future ahead of it and I can't wait to see what they do. But I'm so glad this brought so much attention and um, popularity of the sport to Australia and that the women are going to start getting, you know, it, it goes even for Spain and other countries, it was hard to root for Spain in the sense that the Spanish coach apparently is a dick. Um, whether that's true or not, I'm just going by the stories I've heard. But there were 15 players that protested and 12 of them were not taken to play. Three of them were um, because they were protesting what was going on. They care. And hopefully this will give them some ground to stand on to fight for equal pay and to fight for better conditions when it comes to practice and travel. It happened with the 99er team in the United States. That's what shifted things in this country, even though we won four years earlier. Um, but it, it was that team that really got the popularity of the, of this, of this sport going. So I'm so glad to see that in Australia. I hope it, I hope it, it continues. Yeah, me too. And such a better showing, um, by the Australians and Australia than, than in England where the Royals didn't even bother to show up. Didn't even show up. That I'm, I'm still so flabbergasted by the fact that they if that were the men's team, they'd have all been there. Oh, 100%. Charlotte Clymer was tweeting all about this, the misogyny that is 
it, it's just deeply rooted. It's just really unfortunate. But I agree, unless there was some reason that they're not actually putting into the, the press, it is just really unfortunate that none of the royals showed up to support the lioness because they were incredible. And if you can't come, you say why beforehand. Absolutely. You don't not show up and then still not say anything and then come up with some fucked up excuse. It's it's I, I'm 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 still mad about that. I'm with Charlotte on this one. I really am. Like, ugh, so mad about that. So it's so wonderful to see how much support they had. Um, and I'm I was with you. I was I was rooting I was rooting for them as well. Um, down in Australia after after we got knocked out. Just such a the spirit behind it, the camaraderie behind it, the energy behind it. It's it's. It, it, it's catching. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. And it was also so to see, wonderful. it was so cool. Like I said, it, when they when they talked about it, mirroring the 99ers is that dads and their young boys, they, they, they were wearing the jerseys of these female yeah. players. It changes culture. It, it changes things in the most beautiful way. So I loved seeing it. Yeah. And also much better than the right wing in America. When we got knocked out, they were all happy. Yeah. They're just assholes. Just so fucked up. Anyway, thank you for all of these good news submissions. We really appreciate them. If you have any good news, please, please don't hesitate. Like right now, like you're almost home from your walk, listening to this show. It's a half hour walk. Uh, and then, you know, you get sit down, write me a good news submission. You can do it by going to dailybeanspod.com and clicking on contact. And uh, I'm about to get out of here and head over to uh, to the Patreon meetup in Denver. So I look forward to meeting all of y'all. You'll be listening to this tomorrow after we already met. Hope I wasn't too weird. Uh, do you have any final thoughts before we get out of here, Dana? I do not. Just everyone have a great night. All right. We'll be back in your ears tomorrow. Until then, everybody, please take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Take care of the planet. Take care of your mental health. Vote blue over Q. Take everyone you know with you. I've been AG. And I've been DG. And them's the beans. The Daily Beans is written and executive produced by Allison Gill with additional research and reporting by Dana Goldberg. Sound design and editing is by Desiree McFarlane with art and web design by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. Music for The Daily Beans is written and performed by They Might Be Giants, and the show is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, please visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media. Hi, I'm Liz Winstead. I'm Moji Alawode Al. And we're the hosts of Feminist Buzzkills, the only weekly podcast that helps you navigate the post row hellscape. We dissect all the news from that sketchy intersection of abortion and misogyny with our guests, the abortion providers and activists working on the ground. Plus, we have amazing comedians to help us laugh through the rage. Feminist Buzzkills drops Fridays wherever you get your pod fix. Listen and subscribe, because when BS is popping, we pop off. I'm Frances Callier. And I'm Angela V. Shelton. And we're Frangela. You know what you need in your life? Hmm. The Final Word Podcast. Yes, you do. That's right. It is the final word on all things political and pop cultural. Where we make real news real funny. Where we inspire you so you can hashtag resist. Subscribe and get a new episode of The Final Word Podcast each week. It's the news we think you need to hear. That's right. We think you need to hear it. Okay. Yeah, it's what we say so. That's right. And because all we do is give, every Thursday you can listen to our hysterical podcast, Idiot of the Week. We round up the stupid because you know what? Somebody has to. Okay. All we do is give.